Hello everyone. Welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living Victoria. My name is Carrie Hunter and I'm the spiritual director of the Center in Victoria and we are located at 380 Cook Street in the Cook Street Village Activity Center should you wish to join us some Sunday morning. We'd be delighted to see you there. 10.30 for meditation and 11 o'clock for a celebration service and then tea and coffee and goodies afterward. It would be wonderful to welcome you there in person. But meanwhile, it's great to have you here online. My topic today is, well, imagine that. And as I said to my congregation this morning, this now being Sunday afternoon as I'm recording this, um, you know, I don't know what I was thinking many weeks ago when I came up with that title. It just was something that popped into my head. And I promised to use it at least once during my talk. Uh, because I I just was, you know, not really having any idea what it was I wanted to say. And someone said to me, you know, you can kind of use a title for just about anything that you're doing. So let's see where that takes us today. So as many of you know, I was uh, visiting family in Banff a few weeks ago. And uh, two weeks ago, I was driving back from Banff to Victoria. And... What I like to do is listen to music as I'm driving, and I am part of Spart I'm part of Spotify, and I had downloaded a lot of music that I really loved onto my cell phone. And so when I'm in my car, I just hook up with Bluetooth, and away we go. My playlists, lots of wonderful music. So I did that as I was coming home. But what happened was, after one song had played, all of a sudden I heard Oprah Winfrey's voice. And she was saying, welcome to Super Soul Sunday podcasts. Well, I hadn't signed up for those. I didn't really know they existed. And I thought, oh, I wonder what this is about. And I thought, well, I'll listen, well, it turned out that it didn't just stop with one. I listened to them all the way home. And it was a real treat. It was kind of like having Oprah as a passenger in the car and some of her guests as well, which would be a little fantasy of mine, driving around with people of that kind of consciousness. So one of the first ones was, um, was a, a wonderful nun from the Catholic tradition, Sister Joan, and I can't remember her last name. I'm sorry, it starts with, I think it starts with a CH. It's something like just at all. Anyway, I have to look it up. I did make a note of it. Um, uh, through a Google search so I can find it again, but right now it's not at my fingertips. Anyway, Sister Joan is an 82-year-old nun. She's written 50 books, and she was just talking about her belief systems and how she got there and what's important to her. And the, she started out almost right away saying, you know, God is not some old man in the sky which is something that I'm always saying, you know, God is within us. Spirit, this power, this energy is within us. And I, you know, I thought, this is really, really wonderful. 82 years a nun in the Catholic tradition, a Benedictine nun who's written 50 books, and she's speaking the same language that we do in our teaching. And... You know, I will go into more of that another day because I'd like to do a whole talk on, on Sister Joan. She truly is remarkable, and I want to order some of her books. The next one was Carolyn Mace, the author of Anatomy of a Spirit. That was her first book, and I imagine a lot of you read that book. And it was published somewhere around 1997. And um, Oprah, when, <laughs> when she was introducing Carolyn Mace, she said, you know, I'm really kind of nervous because um, Carolyn Mace can read energy, and she can, she can read your entire history of your body, of your life, when she, when she just looks at you and looks at your energy field. And she said, so I've been really polishing up my energy. And I laughed, and I thought, yeah, I'd be polishing mine up too if I were about to meet Carolyn Mace. Anyway, Carolyn came out, and, um, and they, they started to chat, and Oprah reminded her of the first time that she was on Oprah's television show, which was 1998. And they were into the interview, and Oprah noticed that people in the audience were kind of twitching around and looking at their watches and looking kind of perplexed. And so she stopped the interview, and she said, 
I don't know what's going on out there. You know, somebody tell me what's going on. Going on. You're looking at your watches. You you don't seem to be really present. And finally, one man said, "We don't know what the hell you're talking about." And Oprah said, "Well, this is a spiritual discussion." And he said, "Spiritual?" He said, "You mean like Jesus? You're doing a Jesus talk, um, or John the Baptist talk?" And Oprah realized that she had an audience that was just not tuned in to spiritual teachings. That was 1998. And as she was interviewing um, Carolyn in, in this most recent interview, it was, um, it was at an event that she was hosting, that she, Oprah, was hosting. And uh, she said, you know, how things have changed because everybody in the audience was there because of spiritual teachings. So we've come a long way since 1998, and even before that, you know, I, I used to work in the film and television business, and I remember when Shirley MacLaine uh, made the series, made a, a mini series called Out on a Limb, which was based upon a book she'd written. It was a very courageous thing for her to do, and I was surprised. I saw it on network television, and I thought, "What's going on? This is on. This is being aired on CBS in prime time." And then I discovered that Shirley had paid for the time to. Uh, to pu put that up in, in, in prime time. Well, she received death threats. Um, she was victimized in so many ways. She was called a witch. Um, and, uh, people, people were absolutely dreadful to her, and she was her life was in danger. And of course, that was from the Christian right, who just thought, she, you know, what she was doing was blasphemous. And it was, you know, a few years later that Shirley was back on television with other spiritual programming that people were hungry for. We, you know, have a thirst for it. So just a little bit of background there, because Carolyn talked a little about that. And she said, you know, before World War II, we were flatlining as a people. You know, we believed what we had heard about religion, um, you know, uh, we believed in a God that was somewhere up there in the sky who was judging us, who would punish us, who would send us to hell if we committed a sin. And uh, and she said that that was all before the war. And she said after the war, those of us who were born after World War II, she said we weren't born flatlining, we were born of fire. She never did explain what she meant by that, but as her talk continued, I felt that what she meant is that we were born into the light. And she said the thing is that we didn't know it. We didn't know what that was. All we knew was that all of a sudden in our lives there seemed to be this kind of stress, some chaos. We couldn't understand it. There was a, a feeling of not being fulfilled in some way. And so we went about trying to find these things in all kinds of different ways. And it reminded me of a conversation I had with someone, a doctor who lives in Canmore, Alberta. Uh, and he built a wellness center there. And it was not your typical wellness center. It was not, uh, it, 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 there were not medical doctors there. It was, it, it, there were spiritual practices that were, were being done there. And just an extraordinarily beautiful human being. And he said that, um, that Banff, Alberta, Lake Louise, the Canmore area, he said they're the home of St. Michael and, and, it, and it's called St. Michael's Retreat, the entire area. Now I had heard about that before and I know that many years ago in Banff there was a huge conference. People came from all over the world to attend St. Michael's Retreat. But I didn't know that there's the belief that St. Michael um, and the energy of St. Michael makes its home in that area of the Rocky Mountains. And one of the things in, that happens in Banff, or that has happened in Banff now for, for quite a few years, I would say maybe, oh, probably the past 25 years, a lot of young people drink very heavily. A lot of them are into drugs. And probably older people are as well. And what this doctor in Canmore said to me was, this is such a spiritual place that young people who do not know about spiritual things, who do not know God, and, and others as well who don't, um, he, he said they drink heavily or they use drugs heavily. 
because they can't handle the energy. They can't handle that spiritual energy. And so we all deal with these things in different ways. If we're in a place where we can't handle the energy, it means that there is something in us that is calling us, calling us to do something. And again, years ago, I remember uh, this, the uh, island of Maui is my favorite place on earth, and it's my spiritual home. I have always wanted to live there. And, um, and I can remember being told by people on the island that, uh, that Maui is a place where it doesn't, macho men are not comfortable. If they're macho, they want to get off that island really fast. That there's a more feminine energy there, um, you know, an energy of love and compassion. And people who resonate to that just can't get enough of it. And at the time, I thought that was really interesting. Um, you know, I mean, I, I had nothing to compare it with, and I had no research on it. But again, this raised its head or raised its voice, I guess in the Canadian Rockies, in those areas which are said to be St. Michael's Retreat, where people are abusing themselves because they can't handle the energy. And that's really not, well, it is a bit about what Carolyn Mace was talking about. Because she said that, you know, those of us who were born after the Second World War, we have this, this feeling within ourselves. There's something that we need to know. There's something that we need to do. It's an inner calling. And she said that she was born with genius inside her that she was totally unprepared for. She didn't know what to do with it. She didn't know what it was. And the thing is that she could see the energy of people. She could see if they had an illness. She could see what caused the illness. And she could work with them to heal it. She didn't know that she could do that. She didn't know she could heal people. All she knew was that she could see this energy. And uh, she said, you know, this was a time where where people didn't say, well, you know, maybe it comes from a past life. Let me consult my past lives um, or, um, you know, let me fluff up my aura. Uh, you know, let me check in on my chakras. Uh, it, I mean, there's, there's no way that anyone would have entertained any of those things back in the late 40s and the 50s and even, you know, 60s and so on. I don't know for how long. Um, I was fortunate to come into spirituality at a very young age. However, um, she said that this is indicative, um, this distress that, that people go through is indicative of, of an inner calling that they're not responding to. And she said she always wanted to be in publishing. She wanted to write novels. She said, turns out she's not any good at it. She has absolutely no talent for it at all. But she has this amazing talent, this genius for healing. And she, she didn't know what to do with it until, you know, she started to address it. She started to go within. She started to think about it. She started to meditate, which she hadn't done before. And all of a sudden, as she, when she wrote the book, Anatomy of an Illness, or Anatomy of Healing, was it? Sorry if I've got it wrong here. Um, Sunday afternoon, I'm usually in an altered space after our Sunday morning services. Anyway, she... Um, she realized that, um, that, that people who had experienced severe trauma developed sicknesses. And she had to find a way to work with them, a way to tell them about it, a way to help them process through it so that they could heal. And it, 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 the interview was only 20 minutes long she, because there were a lot of speakers. And so she didn't get to say everything that she did, but she said, you know, if you're sick, if you've got something going on for you and you're thinking, why me? I'm a spiritual person. I live a good life. I eat properly. You know, I do all the right things. She said, well, why not you? You know, what makes you so special that it shouldn't happen to you, that it should happen to that person over there or that one over there? You know, she, she, said, she said, that's not really what it's about. Things happen to us along the way that we store in our bodies that can create, create illness. And one of the things that I really loved about that is that in the, the teaching of science of mind, is very, very often we will hear people say, oh, well, you know, what were you thinking that you got cancer? What were you thinking that you got that disease? And I have never said that. That has never come out of my mouth as a minister or, or prior to that either because I just never believed it. 
um, I believe that there are circumstances that, that create illness. It's not simply a matter of consciousness. I believe that, you know, that environmental things play a role in it. The foods we eat today play a role in, in our health. Um, you know, certainly relationships with, with people, different kinds of people, can play a role in it. Um, genetics play a role in it. But the thing that I always say is, once we understand this teaching, if we are ill, then we know what to do about it. We know how to change our thinking. We know how to think positively. We know how to tell our bodies to heal. We know the power that is within us. And so many people have said, well, you know, Dr. Holmes said that we, you know, we created this ourselves. And if, no, he didn't. Show me a place where he said that we create illness because of, of what we believe, because of what we think. Now, I can't remember if it was in the Science of Mind textbook or in Living the Science of Mind, but there's a place where he, he addresses illness. And, of course, back in the early days, um, 1926 onward, when he was teaching, uh, tuberculosis was the most common dreaded disease at the time. And he said, do you really believe that someone sat around and thought, I'd, I'd like to have tuberculosis, I think I'll take that on now? He said, absolutely not. You know, that's not how it happened. But he said, with right thinking, we can, we can change that. You know, with, I mean, Bruce Lipton and Greg Braden today are saying, you know, that, 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 that our thinking can change our genetics, our genetic predisp predisposition to have anything. But the thing is, what we need to look at, according to Carolyn Mace, is trauma in our lives. Where did somebody hurt us so deeply? Where did we suffer such pain that we've left it inside ourselves and it needs to heal so that we can fully heal? Well, the next, um, the next Soul Journey podcast was with Lady Gaga. And she had, a, had sustained applause as she came out on the stage and sat down to speak to Oprah. And she said she was very nervous. And Oprah said, you're nervous? Like, how could you be nervous? And she said, listen, I was backstage. She said, I prayed eight times backstage before coming out here. And Oprah said, why? Like, why would you do that? And she said, well, arguably, you are the most powerful woman in the world. And I'm, I was about to talk to you. Hugely respectful thing to say to Oprah Winfrey. And she would not be the first to say that about her. So they began to talk, and Oprah asked her if she would share her story. And Lady Gaga said that that's why she was there. She wanted to. And she had actually taken, she had actually, uh, she was going to be on holidays. And she decided to give up her holidays in order to go to Florida, where Oprah was doing this event, so that she could be on her show and, uh, and so that she could talk to her and talk to the audience about her life. And it was profoundly moving. She said that she has fibromyalgia. She said that from the top of her head to the tip of her toes, sometimes the pain is so great that she can scarcely stand it, but she will still go out on stage and perform. And she said she wasn't always like that. She said when she was 19, she was repeatedly raped. And she didn't say it, but it sounded as if it was somebody that she had to work with in order to further her career. And the reason I say that is she said, you know, the Me, Me Too movement came along and I did not report this person because I didn't want to have to live through it again. She put that behind her. But she said a couple of years after the repeated rapes, she developed fibromyalgia and she said the pain was so incredible that one night she took herself to the hospital and she said the doctor didn't give her medication. What, what he did was he called in a psychiatrist. And that psychiatrist is still her psychiatrist today. And the psychiatrist said that fibromyalgia and some other illnesses are caused from terrible trauma in a person's life. And 
and and he said that he wanted he wanted to know what her trauma was and eventually she fessed up to what she had gone through and how she felt about herself how she felt about everything and he didn't give her pain kills painkillers he did give her, her an anti antidepressant to this day she takes antidepressants she does not take pain painkills painkillers pain pills <laughs> pain pills pain pills um she uh she said she needs to know that pain it's not always there it's not always that severe but she said there has been a great gift in that pain and she said the gift in that pain was that she wanted to ease the pain of others and she and her mother started a foundation with all of her money the foundation is called born this way and it's it's been adopted by the gay and lesbian movement um, you know who really appreciate that she understands that they were born that way that this wasn't just something that they chose somewhere along the way that this you know this was this was with them from the time they were born and she said you know it, it wasn't simply about gay and lesbian behavior and she's not she's not a lesbian um, but she said it it's a, it's about trauma of all kinds the way that people have been mistreated you know we are all born this way and then we all have things that happen to us along the way and she said you know at a soul level we have to heal this is a soul thing. And Carolyn Mace talked about that. And Carolyn said, you know, um, do you know where your soul is? Can you feel your soul? She said, imagine that, um, you know, well, imagine that. I said I would say it at least once. Um, she, said, she said, imagine, if you will, um, a time when someone really hurt you badly. And you've been carrying it with you for a long time. And whenever you think about it, it still hurts. And she said, then imagine that person coming to you and saying, you know, I know that I hurt you very badly a number of years ago, and I'm very sorry. You know, I just, I want to tell you that it's been bothering me, and I just want to tell you that. And she said, how do you feel? She said, well, it's nice that they came to say something, but you don't feel, you don't feel your soul. And then she said, imagine that somebody comes to you and says, you know, a number of years ago, I hurt you very badly. I was conscious of it. I consciously knew that I hurt you and I didn't do anything about it. I just walked away. And I'm here today to tell you that I sinned against you. It's not a word that we use in our teaching, sin, because it, in Greek, the Greek translation um, is missing, missing the mark. But she said, imagine this person says, I sinned against you. What I did against you was a sin. What I said to you was a sin. The way I treated you was a sin. I have sinned. I am so sorry for what I did. I'm so sorry for hurting you. I get down on my knees and today I ask for your forgiveness. And Carolyn May said, can you feel that? Can you feel that somewhere in your body? She said, that's your soul. That's your soul that you're feeling right now and she said and that's where the healing has to take place and the thing is that that person who hurt you may not be around to to do to ask for your forgiveness or you may you may have hurt yourself by accepting it by accepting whatever that person said by allowing it to live within you you know giving it free rent in your head free rent in your body and that has created illness within. And so what we need to do is to imagine the situation where that person comes to us and asks for forgiveness, says, I have sinned against you. I consciously hurt you. You know, will you please forgive me? But also we need to do that to ourselves. We need to ask ourselves for forgiveness forgiveness for carrying those things, for harboring those feelings, for harboring the hurt. Forgiveness for anyone, anywhere that we've hurt along the way. So important. 
for our healing. And so both she and Lady Gaga were talking about this soul's journey, this healing of the soul that has to take place in order for physical healing to take place. Carolyn May said, it isn't going to happen from up here. Your mind isn't going to do it. It has to happen at a soul level. So if we are experiencing any kind of illness or distress in our lives, then it's time for us to examine our lives. What happened to us when we were two years old, three years old, a baby? What happened to us when we were 15, 16, 19? What happened to us last year? What happened? Do I have an illness of some kind? And if I do, did I suffer a traumatic experience that I remember? And even if I don't remember, let me have this conversation with God to forgive whatever it was, to forgive, or to forgive whoever it was, to forgive myself, to surrender, to absolutely surrender, because that's the path to healing. That's the road that we're all on. And when we understand this about ourselves, then things around us that seem chaotic start to uh, start to come into order. These feelings that we have, there's, you know, this, this calling. Oprah calls it a calling. Um, Carolyn Mace called it the genius inside us. Um, uh, Paolo Coelho who was another interview, calls it, um, uh, what did he, he calls it our destiny. We, he said we all have it. Each one of us has it. And I was thinking about two women that I, I know, uh, both named Barbara. Uh, one of them lives in Banff, where I lived for many, many years. And Barbara's mother, always said to her that she should be an architect. Barb liked to draw, and her mother thought that would be a distinct, distinguished career. And so Barb went to university and studied architecture. And today she runs a major art gallery in Banff, and she loves it, and she loves her life. She's doing what she was really called to do, to express art in a different way. Not She's never practiced architecture. She's just She's always been the woman in charge of the gallery that she owns now. And the other Barb, um, Barb Stegman, I've talked about her before, not online, but I, I've talked about her in my in my center. And um, my my daughter Kendall is a journalist, among other things, and she, uh, she interviewed Barb a couple of years ago. But I had met Barb when she was about 21. She lived in Burnaby, B.C., and uh, she was a um, public relations person for something called Pioneer Days. And I met her in Pioneer costume. She was wearing a bonnet. And, you know, we had a wonderful conversation. A mutual friend introduced us. And, and I was really impressed with her. She's a lovely young woman. Well, today, Barb, I mean, everybody told Barb she should be in public relations, that she was a natural. Today, Barb has a perfume factory called Seven Virtues. And it's in Nova Scotia, where she lives. And I won't get into the long story about how that happened, although I will talk about it another day. But what she did was she set up businesses for women in Afghanistan and Rwanda and in other developing countries where she would buy blossoms from them to make the perfumes. And the, 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 the bay in Canada was the first... Uh, retail outlet to, to sell seven virtues and they may be the exclusive one I don't know that but they're beautiful perfumes anyway Barb was at a party one night that she was she was invited to and she was sitting by herself kind of feeling like a fish out of water she didn't really know anybody and all of a sudden Bill Clinton came up to her she was wearing a name tag they all were and he asked her if Hillary had found her yet and she said uh, no. And he said, oh, she's been looking for you. Let me go and get her. Stay right where you are. <laughs> so he brought Hillary back. And Hillary said, I know about the work that you're doing with your perfumes. 
She said, Bill and I are going to Haiti. We like to help the people of Haiti. We'd like to take you with us. And we would like you to work with the women there to set up businesses so that they can sell their blossoms to you as well. Well, Bar and Barb went to Haiti with them, and she did She did this. And then when she was talking to my daughter, she said, Can you believe it? She said, Bill and Hillary Clinton? She said, I could hardly breathe. You know, I mean, imagine. Just, well, imagine that. <laughs> I mean, what an extraordinary thing. Barb was called to do something other than pu public relations. She was called to do something on this planet on a magnificent scale. There are those who might say we are all called to do something on a much bigger scale than what we are doing. And that's where this self-examination comes from, this self-determination. Because when we start doing those things, the doors open wide for us. We are led along a path. We are, we are led to do exactly what it is that we have imagined we could do. And it can come from the simplest thing. For Barb, it came from, she was sitting, she was in Afghanistan, and she was sitting, and she drew a flower one day, and she looked, and she thought, hmm, that would be pretty on a perfume bottle. Simple as that. All of a sudden, she realized all of the incredibly pover poverty-stricken women around her and what she could do to help. Do we listen? No. One of my favorite expressions is, in the silence there are many answers. And so, it's, it's time to remember those things, to sit in the silence and listen. What is it that is still mine to do? What is it I was always called to do that I haven't yet done? And then open the doors to God to make it happen, to show you the way to show you the path. It's so easy to discard this. It's so easy to say, oh, no, not me. You know, I'm too old. I'm not smart enough. I'm not educated enough. I'm, you know, whatever, whatever the not enough happens to be. The thing is, we are all enough. We're all children of God. We all have this divine spark of God within us. We have absolutely everything we need to get where we're going. We are the heart and soul of God. Paulo Coelho said, um, you know, our souls come from the heart of the universe. I can just imagine Oprah Winfrey saying, well, imagine that. And so today I say, imagine that. But imagine yourself as the highest and best that you can be. And then follow the instructions that you're given along the way. Thanks for being here with me today. I'm very grateful and I just bless you all and look forward to seeing you again. Bye for now.